we had noticed signs saying hot springs so many miles out of Fairbanks. We had all decided then that we would relax our aching, tired bodies when we got there. Unfortunately, when we arrived, it was very early into morning with the beginning of daybreak having been out for under an hour. We found the owners still sleeping. We decided not to wait the two hours until it was open and instead headed towards Fairbanks. We arrived in Fairbanks around 8 a.m. and stayed for a little while. We all went our separate ways and planned to meet back at the bus in two hours. I looked at the town's curio shops and wandered along the sandy river's edge of the town. We were back on the road by 10 a.m. By 4 p.m. we arrived at Mount McKinley and two hours later we drove up to one of the many roads assessing the mountain. A dirt road led us to a beautiful stream a short distance away. We all embarked from the stuffy school bus out to, into the warm summer afternoon with the fragrance of Alaska's wild flowers soothing our nostrils and triggering our minds, remembering our first loves and her body scent. We built a small fire and talked about old flames. Shortly after that, we decided to have an early night and be back up by We all had a good sleep in the bus that night, and we were back on the road by 5.30 a.m and arrived in Anchorage at 7.30 a.m. into a 24 facility to each other. I walked down about two miles away and wandered around there until noon. At that time, I felt uneasy about the city's surroundings and felt homesick for my family and friends in Vancouver. It was then that I decided to go back home. I walked back out to the outskirts of town to the highway. I had decided to hitchhike back to Vancouver. My first ride, a fellow about my age, picked me up in his old style powerful Camaro. He was a quiet man, and his mind was set on reaching his destination, Eagle, Alaska, some 60 miles away. We were there in no time, and he let me off at this service station at the side of the highway. Within one half hour, a gentleman a few years older than I gave me a ride in his older style beat-up Datsun pickup. Right away, I knew this guy was eccentric, and he was going a little too fast for my comfort. A few times, I politely asked him to please slow down. His excuse was he wanted to get to a barn dance which was less than an hour's drive away. I know he was not listening to me, and he wanted to get there in record time. The scariest part of the ride was the last few miles. The road was, was a narrow, two-lane highway, very windy, with dense bush up close to the highway on either side. When we reached the barn, he parked his truck in front of the building and we said our goodbyes. I continued down the road 
with my 80 pound canvas army pack. I walked a couple of blocks and I was out of this small town. I tried hitchhiking for an hour, but was out of luck. I explored my surroundings for the next three hours, discovering a well-used dirt road adjacent to the highway. I backtracked a short distance until I came across another dirt road. I followed this windy road deeper into the forest. The birds were busy singing away. I thought my senses were tuned into every noise and movement, but that was not so. No more than ten feet in front of me, a moose six feet in height darted from one side of the bush to the other. The experience was such a shock to me, and the thought of being trampled to death was so real. I had to sit down on a nearby rock and recuperate. Getting my strength back, I went on. The road straightened out and I could see about a quarter of a mile. To my surprise, there was a tra trailer sitting there. As I came closer, I noticed the front door half open and half hanging by its top hinge. It was, a very, it was very clear to me that it had been vacant for a long time, perhaps since the 1960s. I entered into a drab and musty place. It was like something out of Woodstock. There was clothing and records of that era scattered inside the trailer. Some of the records were of my taste, so I decided that I would come back for them later, 20 years of. I left the trailer and went and did some more exploring. A well-used trail led me to a river a short distance away. The river was a, about a quarter of a mile across with a narrow strip of solid rocky ground and driftwood running parallel up the middle of the shallow riverbed. There were boulders, so I used them as stepping stones to the narrow strip of the island. I decided to build, build a small fire and rest for a while. Remembering that there was a single-sized mattress back inside the abandoned trailer, I went back for it. I dragged it on the trail, then balanced it on my head, back to my campfire. I laid on it for about one hour, but felt tired still when I got up. I guess because I kept thinking about some wild animal devouring me. I put my fire out, and headed back to the highway. On the way back to the highway, I realized that I was heading further towards nowhere and the sun had begun to escape me. So with that in mind, coupled with the fact that I had no money and no means by which to support myself, I headed towards the nearest town, Anchorage. Trying my luck at hitchhiking again, it paid off. By 7 p.m., I was on my way back to Anchorage. At, and by 8.30 p.m., I was in a suburb of Anchorage. I had just put my thumb out, and a man of, of about 65 years of age gave me a ride to as far as he was going. He let me off at the bus stop and told me what bus to take into town. I stayed in Anchorage 
for three months and to my surprise had a great time. I will share some of those stories with you. I located a Catholic church downtown and they set me up for a night in a hostel. By the time I had arrived, it was late in the evening. I was shown my bunk by an in impatient brute. When I decided to turn the light uh, on in my room, I was told in a miserable tone of voice, Turn that light off! Which I did. There was a window by my bed, so I opened it. The same person told me to close it. It's not safe to leave it open, he said. So I closed it. I left my clothes on and climbed up to my top bunk. I had a hard time sleeping because it was very stuffy and the large black man below me snored heavily all night. The next morning, I was very happy to be out of that hostel. Leaving the hostel, I went back to the Catholic Church for guidance. The secretary was very helpful and suggested that I go to the Salvation Army. So I went there and I was treated kindly and was told how I could stay there and the Salvation Army rules. A man and a wife were running the place. They told me rent would be $120 a month. And if I went down to the Human Resources Center, they would pay $60 towards my rent. So for the next three months, I went to Human Resources and had a roof over my head. To pay the remaining $60 a month, I would go to temporary manpower services, which I felt the desire to work. Within two days, I could earn $60. The nice thing about it is, I could choose what days during the month, because there was always lots of work around. As far as food went, the Salvation supplied donuts and coffee every morning and late at night. For my dinner, I would go to the Gospel Mission. Sometimes there would be a sermon before supper. If you were not present, you would not get any dinner. For the first month of my stay, I roomed with one other man. He worked full-time and pretty much kept to himself, and he also liked to weightlift. He was a quiet and serious man. I bought a stereo for $15 so that I could play the records that I had found in the trailer. Some days I would play them when my roommate was working. The second and third month, I was moved to another larger room. There were three of us there. That was an experience. One of the men had a cocaine problem. Every time he would hear a siren outside, he became paranoid. He told me he thought they were after him. The managers found out from someone that he was doing drugs in his room. So, so they did a search and found needles in his garbage pail beside his bed. One of the, third, one of the first things everyone was told was no drugs or alcohol. He was told to leave the premises the next morning. My other roommate was a young schizophrenic man six foot six and well over 250 pounds. He always carried a hunting knife with him. He even wore it to bed. On several occasions, 
I would encounter him